Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Impressionist movement. You may be familiar with many of the works that we will be looking at today. Impressionism today has become a style that is very much celebrated for its beauty. However, this was not always the case. Impressionism had a very critical reception when the movement first emerged, and the artists, just like those of the avant-garde of the realism movement, were not very popular for their work either. Here is a list of some important terms and people for this unit. These would be useful to refer back to when writing your unit reflection. Feel free to pause the video now and write some of these down. To be clear, this movement did not stem out of realism. It was occurring at the same time as the avant-garde movement, starting in about the 1870s. Just like with the realists, this group of painters was inspired by the changing society, the industrial revolution, and the invention of new technologies, as well as the changing social structure and the emergence of a strong middle class. There was one particularly important invention, and that was the packaging of oil paint in foldable, sealable aluminum tubes. Before, artists had to mix their own paint and had to paint in their studios because it was messy and not portable. Now, artists could take their easels and paint with them and go paint outside, directly from nature. This was a huge deal. Artists had generally not been able to do this before. This style of painting directly from nature, outside, was called en plein air, or in the open air. Many of these artists, like the realists, were rejected from the Royal Academy Salon in Paris, so they started their own group, the Anonymous Society of Artists, Painters, Sculptors, Engravers, etc., in direct defiance of the Salon. They did this on the recommendation of anarchist scholars, who urged people to form their own grassroots organizations separate from the government and empower each other. They did just this, hosting their own salons. Eventually, the popularity of these salons surpassed that of the official state-sponsored French Academy salons and made them obsolete. So how do we define the Impressionist style? Well, first, it is important to establish that though the movement was occurring at the same time as realism, the focus of Impressionist artists was the creation of a new, modern painting style, not the production of social commentary, like the realists. The name Impressionism actually comes from Monet's famous painting, Impression Sunrise. A critic, upon viewing this painting, mocked it and said that an impression was correct because it was so inaccurate to nature. However, Monet liked the name and thought it suited the style. His intention was to capture an impression, like an imprint, of an ephemeral or fleeting moment in time. One of the ways these artists were able to capture these fleeting moments was by studying the effects of natural light and atmosphere. They tried to capture these by painting outdoors and applying the paint in thick layers with loose, patchy brush strokes. The color schemes of these paintings, like Monet's Impression Sunrise, were usually bright and pastel. The subject matter of these paintings was also often oriented around nature. Thanks to the invention of aluminum paint tubes and the newfound portability of these artistic materials. Artists painted scenes of nature, parks, and rural areas, but almost always with some element of urban society. This was usually done by showing the newly formed middle class enjoying leisure activities outdoors. Let's take a closer look. Do you see how every part of this painting, every inch of the surface, is covered in these thick, visible brush strokes? Despite the semi-abstract method of painting, we get a very clear image of what's going on here. Not just an image, but a sense of being there. We're standing at the docks of a harbor. You can see the thick clouds of smoke coming from the ships in the distance. We get the sense that it's very foggy, very hazy, and that fogginess is characterized by that delicate blue light that's cast over the earth as the sun is rising. Monet achieves all of this with a very limited palette of colors, mostly blue and orange. But he has captured a feeling, a fleeting moment. By the time he was done painting, the sun was likely risen. This painting was widely criticized and mocked when first released, but it really fits so perfectly as the namesake for Impressionism, an impression of a fleeting or ephemeral moment. A friend of Monet's once remembered him saying, 
When you go out to paint, try to forget what objects you have before you. A tree, a house, a field, or whatever. Merely think, here is a little square of blue, here an oblong of pink, here a streak of yellow, and paint it just as it looks to you. The exact color and shape until it gives your own naive impression of the scene before you. We see the classic tenets of impressionist style here. Patchy, loose brushstrokes, thick application of paint, an emphasis on capturing light and shadow in a fleeting moment, and of course the pastel color scheme. This was part of a series of paintings that captured this view of the cathedral throughout the day, as the sun hit it in different angles. Remember, it was all about capturing an impression, capturing the feeling and sensation of a quickly passing moment in time. Monet painted a series of these compositions. Here we can see the same scene from the same angle, painted at different times of day with close attention paid to the effects of sunlight on the facade of this building. We really get a sense of the stark, blinding brightness of the sun in the first one with the afternoon sun, the golden glow of the sun setting in the second, and the hazy, bluish morning light of the third, all done with a relatively minimal palette and very patchy brushwork. Look at this painting for a moment and really picture yourself here. You can almost hear the waves crashing, seagulls, the wind whipping around the fabric of your clothing. There's this sense of movement of the waves and the grass, the clouds, uh, the fabric of the women's dresses, all indicated with these very loose brush strokes. It's such a huge contrast to the smoothness of the previous movements that we've looked at. Uh, if we think about even neoclassical art being made not that long ago, and yet those paintings were completely seamless with not a single visible brush stroke. Now with the Impressionists, we have a complete defiance of those academy rules of painting. Instead, uh, loose, patchy brush strokes are being used to bring a sense of life and movement to the composition. And the content itself is, of course, Impressionist, with middle class people enjoying leisure activities. We also have that same light pastel palette that characterizes all of Monet's work. Now that you've looked at a few Impressionist paintings, think about this painting of a train station by Monet. What about this painting makes it Impressionist? Look at the colors used, the type of brush strokes, the lights, and even the subject matter itself. What about all of these makes us characterize this as Impressionism? Another Impressionist painter, Camille Pissarro, is known for his landscape paintings of mixed rural and urban settings. He would often depict semi-rural scenes of nature, but always with an element of urban society, depicting people in nature. Like Monet, in his work we see the same patchy loose brushwork, we see an emphasis on the effects of sunlight and shadow at particular moments or times of day, we see the use of a lighter pastel palette, and we see the middle class depicted, due to this blending of rural and urban themes. It's never blatantly political like the realists, it's just a depiction of the middle class. Pissarro continued to paint these rural meets urban landscapes, also painting outside like Monet and the other Impressionists. Due to being painted in the en plein air method, these paintings always have distinct lighting that gives the viewer a sense of the time of day and of the atmosphere, such as the sensory experience we get from looking at this sunny landscape at Pontoise. As time goes on, Pissarro's paintings become looser and patchier in their brushwork, moving more towards abstraction, actually. The brushwork is more gestural, creating a sort of fuzzier image overall. Renoir, in contrast, painted mostly entirely urban scenes of people from this newly formed middle class doing leisure activities, usually in an outdoor setting, which allows for that en plein air method of painting outside and really trying to capture things as the artist is experiencing them. And that is what Renoir is really trying to do here. He's going against the rules of the academy painting as he's been taught and is instead trying, actually, to capture things exactly as he is experiencing them. This imperfect, patchy view that seems actually more naturalistic than all of those idealized academy paintings, despite the fact that the method of brushwork itself is a bit abstracted. 
Renoir is particularly interested in capturing the way that people interact with each other in real life. Look at the gazes of each of the people in the painting, and their facial expressions, and their poses. The man with his back to us is in a confident stance, looking directly at the girl on the swing, probably flirting with her. The girl on the swing doesn't return his gaze, instead looks away coyly. The man behind them leans on a tree and is looking at the other man. The little girl in the corner looks up at them, hands clasped. This doesn't feel posed, it feels like a natural scene that you would observe, like a snapshot. And the complexity of those gazes, combined with the attention to atmosphere and setting, make it really feel like a real moment in time. The way that dappled sunlight filters through the trees and onto the subjects is something we can really almost experience by looking at it. Here we see another great example of how Renoir really captures very naturalistically the way that people interact in groups. We really get a sense of the atmosphere at this party. We can see the complexity of the interactions, people talking to each other, dancing, smiling, looking away into the distance. It all feels very natural. You can tell this is something that was painted from observation of real life, not posed. So, en plein air method, painting outside, uh, led to this new way of painting nature and landscapes, but also of painting people interacting in groups. Renoir met, became friends with, and was very much inspired by Monet. We can see in this portrait he's painted of Monet in his garden, how much his style became influenced by the very loose and patchy brushwork of Monet. Edgar Degas also liked to paint scenes of urban life, though not just of middle and upper classes, but lower classes as well. He painted scenes of modern life in Paris, focusing on venues of entertainment, opera, racetrack, ballet, and on the entertainers themselves rather than the bourgeois audience. He is particularly well known for his paintings of ballerinas. Ballet dancers were usually from lower class families. Dancing on stage would not be seen as a respectable thing for a middle or upper class woman to participate in, especially because the revealing costumes of the dancers were considered sexually promiscuous. We can see from the mid-action poses of the dancers that this painting was done from observation. Though it has not been painted outside in natural light, we still see the typical impressionist attention to light. Look at the way the dancers' faces are lit in an almost ghostly light, emulating the bright, harsh beam of a stage light, while the dark shadows give us the sense of the cavernous indoor space of the stage. The fluffiness of the ballerina's tutus is suggested with patchy, loose brushwork. The muted pastel palette is also typical of Impressionism. The development of portable paints was great for many artists, allowing them to travel outside to paint. But what about artists that couldn't just travel around the countryside painting? Women could generally not go outside or travel unattended, which severely limited female artists' ability to take part in this trend. However, as a result, female artists were almost entirely responsible for beginning the genre of domestic Impressionist paintings, which now comprise a huge part of the Impressionism movement. It fit right in with one of the main subjects of this style, depicting the newly emerged middle class. Berthe Morisot is a particularly well-known female artist who depicted domestic scenes of largely female subjects. Women artists, such as Morisot, painted the middle class both at leisure or at work, in a domestic context. It shed light on a whole part of society that was largely ignored, and helped female artists gain even higher status, despite the limitations that they faced in making their work. One particular subject of painting that we see over and over again during the Impressionist period is portraits of mothers and children. Before this time, mother and child portraits almost always took the form of Madonna and child, Mary and Jesus. Female painters such as Molisseau and Mary Cassatt popularized this subject in a more secular context. Mary Cassatt's portraits of mothers and children are particularly well known now. A friend of Impressionist painter Degas, as well as realist Manet, Cassatt was praised for her incredible naturalism in capturing intimate moments between mothers and children, as well as her excellent understanding of light and atmosphere rendered in an Impressionistic style. 
Her paintings, like Molisseau, gave an intimate, unidealized view of the domestic life of middle-class women in 19th century France. We can see in this painting that she took inspiration from some realist artists, such as Manet. The almost flat quality of her figures, the stark, dark lines on the pale white skin, the lack of blending to create the look of soft, supple skin, are all things that we saw in realist work, such as Manet's Déjeuner de Soleil and Courbet's Stonebreakers. The unidealized depiction, though not inherently political, still recalls the particular photograph-like quality of realist paintings. Still, the looseness of her brush strokes and the light pastel palette remind us that this is still Impressionist. It's important to remember that these movements were occurring at the same time, and painters from both movements were being ostracized by the French Royal Academy. Though they were different, they certainly borrowed from each other. During the mid-1800s, Japan, previously an extremely isolationist country, was forcibly opened up to Western trade. A few years later, France, England, Russia, and the United States signed trade agreements that allowed the regular exchange of goods. One of the most popular art forms in Japan at the time, prints, were one of the first trade items to blow up in the Western world. They were first exhibited in the Paris International Exposition of 1867, and Parisians in particular became enamored with the Japanese ukiyo-e prints. These are prints that showed leisurely scenes of the Japanese elite, such as geishas. Parisian and other Western artists alike became obsessed with the artistic aesthetic of Japan, so much so that they began to emulate and copy the style whenever they could. A French scholar at this time labeled the craze Japonisme. These are two prints done in the traditional Japanese style by Mary Cassatt. Cassatt was particularly interested in the ukiyo-e prints because they often concentrated on the private lives of women, a subject matter that neatly coincided with her own. She also enjoyed the simplicity of lines and the pastel color schemes that were somewhat similar to her own style. She directly emulated the compositions, designs, and colors of the ukiyo-e prints here, with Woman Bathing, 1891, on the left, and Under the Horse Chestnut Tree on the right, completed in 1898. So, to review what we learned today, Impressionism happened at the same time as Realism, during the late 1800s or the 19th century. It was more focused on depicting the middle class at leisure without the overt socio-political messages of the realist movement. Like the realist movement, the technological innovations of the 19th century had a big impact on this movement. The major contributing technological innovation for Impressionism was the creation of paint in foldable aluminum tubes which allowed for that en plein air method of painting outside. Impressionism was focused on capturing the fleeting or ephemeral effects of light and atmosphere, which is often achieved through this patchy brushwork, the loose brush strokes, and sort of the creative color use, um, using different colors than you would normally see in uh, academy painting, for example. And it can all be really summed up in the sort of phrase that many Impressionist painters would uh, give as advice to other painters, which is to paint what you see and feel, not what you've been taught. So defy the rules of the academy and simply paint from experience.